Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. A pop jet, are they deflating? Does the Fed, the government have everything under control? What is your take on what is happening right now? Well, I, I really do think, um, number one, I think that the whole point of the tax package and the repatriation is to add more air to the bubbles because I don't think they're quite ready yet for that shift to take place. Uh, but right around the time when you and I were talking, I started to notice some significant pattern shift in the insiders trading. And I just finished setting up a report for this week. So we're now in the 13th consecutive week where, and the shift is that while all sectors, according to the Wall Street Journal, while all sectors are selling off their stocks, not all sectors, the insiders, the uh, boards of directors and, and CEO CFOs, not all are buying. And I never noticed that pattern until uh, prior to the end of September. So we're now in the 13th week of that. Um, in addition, just kind of talking about this, uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch ran a survey recently and they have 19 indicators to tell them if we're heading into bear market territory and 11 of them have been triggered. And, and since I started noticing that pattern shift, quite frankly, it's like almost every week I see another pattern shift. So uh, things are definitely shifting, but no, the bubbles have not yet popped. There are holes in them. I will say that. And so that's what I think really the repatriation and the tax changes are, is to put more air in those bubbles and keep them up there for a little while longer. The, the tax and then the repatriation, they want to pop the bubbles by doing this? Is that why they're blowing them up? Or, I mean, when you're saying this, what do you really mean? Like, are they trying to blow them up even more to pop them? Or are they just trying to keep this? I, I don't, you know, I mean, they know that the system died in 2008. They know that better than than I know it. But it's very obvious when you look at what's been going on. Uh, but they are getting, we are inside of, of a massive money standard shift. That's really what the cryptocurrencies are all about. That's going to be the new money standard. Now, I don't think it's going to be Bitcoin, but I think uh, all of these ICOs and Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these guys are being used to get us comfortable with it so that we accept that shift. And remember, they need a large crisis to justify whatever their agenda is. So at the moment, I don't think they're, I don't think they have everything in place to fully make that shift, but they are working furiously at it. And, you know, you know, and I'm sure you've had a lot of other guests on the speed of the changes are, I mean, it's mind boggling how fast these changes are taking place right now. I, I want to get into the cryptocurrency in a little bit, but I just want to go back to the 11 indicators from Bank of America. And we're seeing a lot of indicators showing that either we're already in a recession, we're approaching a recession. But what's very interesting is that we have the data from uh, the government where, you know, unemployment is very low. The stock market is continually moving up. They're telling us that manufacturing is returning and, and booming right now. And they're while well, they were trying to convince us that retail did very well this holiday season. Uh, when we look at this, how can Bank of America say there is, you know, 11 indicators showing that there's a problem when the government is showing us that everything is fine? Well, there is a difference between telling you and showing you, okay? So they're telling us that everything is fine. 
But if you look at their data, I mean, one of my very favorite websites, I'm probably on there every day, is the uh, FRED website from the Federal Reserve where they have all of the graphs. Okay, so they can say that the economy is humming right along, but the velocity, the speed that people are spending money shows just the opposite. It, it's significantly lower than it was during the Depression. So, and that's only one um, indicator. But, you know, like my father always used to tell me, do what I say and not what I do. So I think a much better indicator for the truth is what they're actually doing for themselves. And they've been accumulating gold like crazy for since the crisis. And when you say they've been accumulating gold, who is this? Central banks, governments have been accumulating, except apparently for the U.S. But everywhere else or almost everywhere else, they have been accumulating gold like crazy. In fact, I could be off on this because I don't have the data right in front of me. But I think according to the World Gold Council, uh, year over year, central bank purchases that were up uh, something or gold purchases were up something like 25 percent globally. It's I could be off on that. I don't have that right in front of me. But they were definitely up year over year in the third quarter. The fourth quarter isn't out yet, obviously but through the third quarter of 2017. So if everything is so hunky-dory, why are they even bothering to buy gold? If gold is such an old, worthless relic, why don't they just get rid of it? True. I mean, I mean that that's I, true. I mean, since we're on the gold subject here, uh, China and Russia, they've been accumulating a lot of gold. And we've had the BRICS, which is China and Russia is a part of, and they mentioned that they're going to be starting this gold trade system and they wanted to go live this year. Now, they mentioned this in 2017. What is this going to do for gold if this comes online? Well, first of all, I put as much confidence in what the central bankers in Russia and China tell me as I do in what our central bank tells me. So I'm not saying that they're not going to go live, but when they do, it will be because that will benefit them. It is not that they want gold noticeable to the general public until the central bankers are um, in position to do the reset. And make no mistake, I don't think there's the them and then there's an us. Remember, the IMF, a hundred and what there's 196 countries in the world and 189 of them are members of the IMF and they're all the treasury secretaries and the central bank chiefs. This is a globally coordinated effort. So um, maybe it will be in 2018 because I don't know how long this repatriation is going to hold these markets together. There are too many indicators that are that are showing that the markets are actually breaking down. You know, you can keep throwing money at it and you know for an individual, if you if if something is not working, if you don't have money and you have to replace it, now you got a problem. But if you have lots of money, it's not really a problem. You can throw money at bad choices and cover them up. Now, so that's what that's about. But I think for Russia and China and any of the BRICS nations and anybody, I mean, we know that that's where the power is traveling. So when it becomes beneficial to them to really go live with, um, with a tangible exchange, well, then they will. And that would then you couldn't really hide it with all those paper contracts, could you? No, you if couldn't. everything was deliverable. Yeah, you, you couldn't. We've seen that um, a lot of the Fed houses and the Fed is saying that inflation is starting to tick up and we're starting to see gold move up a little bit. We know the real inflation rate is much higher than what they're saying, but we're seeing gold move up right now. Where do you think gold is going to go? Do you think it's going to move up or do you think they're going to manipulate it to keep it down still? Well, I think it's actually a combination of the two. And interestingly enough, um, I just ran a relative performance chart on gold and the S&P 500. And I didn't print that off. But um, what I saw was that in mid-2015, spot gold 
hit a bottom. So it was up in 2016 and it's been up in 2017. So there too, I'm seeing a pattern shift. Um, they may allow it to run a little bit. I don't think they'll allow it to breach 2000, presuming they can keep control of it which of course that's pretty easy to do through the CME costs them what a buck 10 for what I think it's a uh, hundred ounces of gold and 500 ounces of silver to manipulate the price. But again, that goes back to as long as there's not a physical exchange, you can sell as much gold that doesn't exist, you know, as you want to. But so, so my, my bet on it, God, I mean, you know, as a technician, how can you really even say anything with any certainty? Because even even mainstream media admits that none of the normal technical signals really work anymore because all of these markets are managed, which is another word for manipulated. But, you know, if I could rely on that, then I would say that the um, that the downward shift in the price of gold um, ended in mid 2015 and we're on another bull market leg, but I don't think they'll allow it to get too out of control because then it becomes noticeable They they want eyes on cryptocurrencies. They do not want eyes on gold. Yeah, true. I, I do see that. And, you know, when we talk about gold, I think people don't really understand why you need to have gold and why you should hold gold. I mean, we see countries doing it. We see central banks doing it. And of course, the Fed here is telling us not to hold it. You work for ITM Trading. You know, you're the chief market analyst. Actually, what does ITM Trading do? So just let people know what you do there. Oh, okay. Well, we are a full service brokerage house. So that means that, uh, but what makes us really different, so you can do any kind of gold or silver or any physical metal through us and we deliver the physical metal to you. But what really makes us different than anybody else is the strategy that I created when I was studying currencies back in 87 um, and I saw this repeatable pattern. So what gold really is, is a decentralized money. It's real money, but it's decentralized and it truly is completely outside of the system. It doesn't need networks and computers and nodes or anything. If you, you hold it in your hand, it's physical and it's real. And there is always demand for it across every single aspect of the economy. So we have a strategy that's based upon those repeatable patterns so that people actually know how, when, and where to use the gold through the trend cycle. So what this really does is it, it holds your wealth intact outside of the system truthfully outside of the system. Just to take this a step further. So if the dollar is being devalued, uh, if the currency is collapsing, what does gold do for you? It holds your purchasing power intact, which is exactly what, it, why gold became the primary currency metal. So short term, anything can be manipulated. And, and keeping in mind that the spot market was uh, created to manage what the public sees about gold. Now, that's not the only thing. But even having said that, when the feds were put in place in 1913, a men's suit would be 20 bucks, which was one ounce of gold. You know, in 70, well, let's say in 1981, after that spike, it went up to 825. You could certainly buy more than one men's suit with it. Today at 13, wherever it is, 13, 17 or something like that, you could still buy a really wonderful man's suit. So over time, it holds your purchasing power intact. And, you know, and because it's it's so subtle, the spot gold market, you know, they can either hammer it down really hard or like it's it's a stealth move up. I mean, I wonder how many people realize that year over year gold's moved up over the last two and a half years. 
Probably not many. Um, I, I wanted to get I, I wanted to get into the central banks because the central banks around the world are doing different things. The Fed here is they're starting to unwind. I mean, a very little bit uh, right now. The, uh, so they say uh, they're they're talking about raising the interest rates. Um, and we see the ECB, Bank of Japan, they're keeping the interest rates very low. Some are still negative and they're creating currency. Why do you think we see such a difference between the central banks? Why aren't they all doing the same thing? Why here in the United States? Why is the Fed raising rates and doing the kind of the opposite of what the other banks are doing? Well, I think that it goes, okay, so keep in mind that this is a debt-based system and interest rates guide that debt. So when they want to stimulate the economy, they lower the interest rates to inspire more borrowing and spending. So the difference between, um, like Europe and Japan and Sweden and Switzerland with the negative rates during the next crisis, they've already been testing the boundaries of how low they can push those interest rates and get away with it. And it's not very far uh, as long as there's cash. Anyway, it's not very far here. We haven't gone. We were at zero, but we haven't gone negative but the reason why they want to raise the rates is not to cool down an overheating economy, but rather to give them some dry powder so that during this next financial crisis, they can lower the interest rates. But on average, historically in this country, every time we've gone into crisis mode and they've needed to stimulate, they've lowered the rates by something on average about five and a half percent. Well, that me, their goal is to get up to three and a quarter percent on raising the interest rates. So that means one way or the other, we're going negative. Now, if that crisis were to happen when the public still had the ability to get cash, then you'd have a bank run because people would run to their bank accounts rather than paying that interest on it and pull the cash out. And that limits the central banker's ability to lower the rates. So, you know, the in Europe, I mean, it is likely, well, first of all, the rates are still negative there, but they haven't, I can't even say that we've repaired our bank balance sheets. All we've done is covered them up and put in some accounting gimmicks to hide all of the derivatives. That's exploded, but they haven't even done that in Europe. They haven't done that piece yet. So there is a divergence there. That's one of the pattern shifts. We were the first ones to um, really to do the QE and also to pay banks interest on reserves, which we still do, which is insanity to me. The central bank policy doesn't directly control the interest rates that you and I pay. They're using it. They're um modifying interest rates based on how much they pay the banks. Now that's in this country. So yes, there is a divergence, uh, but how do you, how is the world, how are the global central bankers going to inspire anybody to borrow unless they pay them to borrow, which is what negative rates are. You're paying somebody to borrow. That's the next step. So now, with the Fed raising the rates, I mean, we saw this back prior to 2008. They were raising the rates, raising the rates, raising the rates. And that's where we saw people leaving their homes because they had adjustable rate mortgages. People, you know, people, you know, the, their, the interest rate went up and people couldn't pay certain loans. Isn't the same thing going to happen, though, if they continually raise rates? Are, are we going to see a duplication of what had happened uh, during or prior to 2008? Well, Okay, since this is about wealth transfer, uh, I know I, it's going to be much worse this time simply because the issues are a whole lot larger than they were. Uh, there are not as many variable rate mortgages out there, but if you have one, I would suggest you convert it to fixed as quickly as you can. Do not, you know, do not feel comfortable in those variable rates. But your answer is yes, people will lose their homes. Um, although in the reset, the principal value of your mortgage and your payments also get reset. So there are many reasons why people 
are most likely to lose their homes if they are not prepared to pay them off and to pay the property taxes, which also escalate like crazy, making it hard for people, you know, to maintain their property. Um, so the answer is yes, this is about wealth transfer, but I'm really thinking that inside of this, part of what the goal appears to be is to hold title to wealth inside of these cryptocurrencies. And so I could see them making it look like a benefit if you're going to lose your house, but you hold the title in here, maybe you get some kind of salvation some way. And, and that would be a big push to get property onto the crypto space or in smart contracts and, and held that way. So that's what I think is more likely to happen. The last time, 2008, all that real estate transferred to Wall Street. Well, let's, from talk, Main Street. let's talk about the uh, crypto market here. Now, we hear a lot of people out there. A lot of people have different theories on why Bitcoin is going up and, you know, the crypto market. Some people say the central banks created the cryptocurrencies. Other people are saying that, no, this is a people-driven type of thing. It's completely decentralized. And, you know, everyone has different theories. What do you think this whole crypto market is about? I mean, are the central banks, are they worried about it? Do they want control over it? Do they even care about it? What do you think their, their thoughts are on the crypto market? Well, I think that this, you know, they've wanted to take us cashless since the 20s. So this is not really a new idea. And they've been working consistently in that direction. You know, I read the 1996 NSA white paper on the cryptocurrencies and it seemed, you know, and the 1990, that was six, 97 paper on, uh, on the peer review, peer review on smart contracts. So I'm betting, I can't prove this for sure, but my bet is, is that this was planned and how do you want people to adopt it? You want them to think it's their idea. And I don't think it was a coincidence that it came out in 2009 when the central bank started their injection of the QE, so the hyperinflating of the money supply into the system. And magically, all of a sudden, you know, Bitcoin comes out. Well, if people are afraid of governments and banks, they're not going to fly into an instrument created by them. But so I think that this was sold to us as being outside of the system, but it travels over networks and it travels through nodes and it travels through computers. So it is completely, in my opinion, and from all of the research that I've done, it's in the system. It is the system. It's the new system that they want to drive us to. Now, as far as, um, you know, Right now, really, they're letting the private markets develop all of these new tools and techniques. So exactly which um, which of these tools is going to be used for our new money standard? You know, I think that's up in the air right now. But with them going up, I mean, if they really felt or when they feel threatened, we've seen it over and over again. They shut them down. They make them illegal. They shut them down. So, you know, the fact that they really have had very little regulation up to this point, I think is pretty telling. Now, so do that, I think that, well, go ahead. I mean, there's two people out there, Jeff Nielsen and Jeff Berwick, who are out there and they do, ha they have similar theories, but two different ones. Jeff Nielsen says that Bitcoin is moving up because the central banks, they're using their free money to push it up. And eventually what they're going to do is they're going to sell off what they purchased and say, see, Bitcoin is volatile. We need to take control. Jeff Berwick, on the other hand, is saying that they're pushing this up. And they're going to use Bitcoin to say the economy crashed because of Bitcoin crashing and move us into probably the crypto realm of maybe something that they created, one of their coins, the Fed coin or, you know, the settlement coin or whatever they have. 
I mean, is, is that what you're you're getting at that you think they're they're doing that or something different? No, I actually think it's a combination of the two, to be perfectly frank with you, because if there is indeed, I mean, look, it, it's a it's a computer algorithm. So they can say that there's a certain amount. But if everybody agrees, then there's more. However, if there is indeed a certain amount, certainly it's easy to manipulate the price. I mean, actually, they're they're saying that 40 percent of the bitcoins out there are held in fewer than a thousand hands. Could a central bank be in there? Of course they can. Sure. Um, on the other hand, the way that it could have an impact on the global economy is if they force them now that they're now that there's future co contracts on them. So they're in a few different exchanges that impacts the central clearing houses. And so the, everybody is incestuously intertwined. A uh, Bitcoin market itself and the crypto market itself is relatively small. However, if in, when it's held inside of that kind of system with everybody um, interrelated, that it could certainly create a domino effect. And then they would come out. I agree with uh, with Jeff in that they would come out and say, well, see how volatile and and awful this Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies are. Here's our nice, safe Fed coin or dollar. My guess is in this country, we're going to have a dollar coin. We could also have the Fed coin, uh, but that's been shown um, through the Bank for International Settlements. So I actually think it's a combination of the two of them, just like a housing crisis could force some of those people to put their title onto the asset backed coins, right? So you use a crisis. I mean, that's what they, historically, that's what governments do and central bankers do. They use a crisis to push an agenda. So do you think the, the, the new cryptocurrency currency that they're trying to create, is that going to be worldwide or is it going to be separate currencies? I mean, is this the currency they're going to use, like countries are going to use the trade or are we going to have a different type of model? Well, it, you know, I'm, I'll go by what the Bank for, uh, Bank for International Settlements say. And uh, there would be the SDR that's controlled by the IMF and they would have a wholesale coin. So in other words, that would be for countries and uh, major corporations to trade amongst themselves. And then they would also have a retail coin that an individual could hold. But in addition to that, you would have regional coins. So the Fed coin or the dollar coin or you know, the Corona, the E-Corona or many of the other ones that the individual central banks would um, hold. Because remember, if they just went to a one world currency just like that, everybody would know it. And, you know, look at all all of the issues that are happening around populism and, you know, what's going on in a lot of countries with a lot of the rioting. So, you know, people don't trust the banks and the central banks and, and Wall Street very much anymore. So, no, I don't think that they could just go to one currency, one cryptocurrency. But I think it, that the IMF's SDR will absolutely be the world reserve currency. So all assets would then be valued in terms of SDRs and particularly if they were to, to hold title to all real tangible assets on these cryptocurrencies, well, that could certainly justify that if it was inside of an SDR, which is what AC Chain is doing. They're, they're digitizing tangible assets by holding title on these coins. But when you buy the AC Chain, with Bitcoin or Ethereum, it marries and becomes an SDR. So we're talking about, you know, this transition into this new currency and China recently created the Petro Yuan. Now, was this created to go up against the Petro dollar for this transition? Well, um, I would say kind of yes and no. Uh, China, it takes a lot of, if you're doing individual coins anyway, 
uh, it takes a lot of energy to create those coins. So China's actually been on a buying spree of global energy assets um, for quite some time, just like they've been buying gold. So the power is certainly transitioning there. But what the petro yuan really does is it, it eliminates our advantage because up to that point, well, that's been changing really since 2005. But up to that point, if you were buying oil, you could only do it with dollars. Now you have a different option. Well, that was the whole reason why we retained our status as the world reserve currency in the 70s and the 80s was because of that petrodollar. So with uh, with that happening, I mean, that eliminates that advantage, doesn't it? What's the role of gold in this new currency realm? Well, you know, gold is a stabilizer. It creates limitations and therefore it creates confidence so when we go through this next financial crisis all confidence in the system will be lost so, so should, i mean well go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> sorry so so what is typical and this always happens in the new in the ultimate new currency there is a component of gold in there so that it stabilizes the purchasing power but mostly it instills confidence in the public so first they're going to have to destroy everybody's confidence but that's the role of gold for governments at, is for them to maintain and central banks who really have the power is to maintain that power that's why they're accumulating. So do you think this transition, and I just want to go different phases here, is is the first thing, do you think everything is moving from the West to the East? A hundred percent, yes. Okay. So everything that, I mean, I've seen it too, that China, Russia, they've been duplicating everything that we have here. Now, when this happens, when the transition begins, is it going to happen in one day? Is it going to happen slowly? Will people notice? Should people worry about their savings, their retirement? I mean, how fast will this happen? Well, resets happen slowly until they happen overnight. So, you know, when you ask me that question, we, we've we been talking about the reset. I've been talking about the reset for a lot, a lot of years, and it's been happening. I mean, there's only, if, if you believe the Federal Reserve, according to them, they've already reset the currency by 96%. It's just that it happened over a period of time. And even when you were talking to me, you know, about creating the yuan and all the systems that duplicate the West systems, well, that's, that is the reset happening. The cryptocurrencies, that is the reset happening. We're actually living through it. But once they get to a certain point, which, uh, okay, presuming they can keep control because that's a big part of the speed that this happens. If they can keep control, then everything will be in place. There will be a war, a crisis. I mean, look at how much is going on right now. You've got the pension crisis. I mean, there's a lot of things brewing um, on the, well, that are actually already starting to unfold. This is not future stuff. This is occurring right now. And so it kind of feels like nothing's happening because unless people, unless it's so in your face that you can't ignore it, most people think that nothing's really happening when it's happening in pieces. But as long as they can maintain control, it happens overnight. If, however, they lose control, they really lose control, then it's still going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen sooner than they would have planned. So the ultimate reset always goes overnight and gold in the reset always looks like this. Now, if it's a market planned reset, then it goes like that. But uh, so you have a little bit more ramp up. But if it's a government, a central bank planned reset, then it goes like that. So now, what about those people who are sitting there, you know, they're following, but they don't they're saying, ah, 
you know, this is not really going to happen. I'm going to keep my dollars in the bank. I'm going to keep my investments where they are. I have nothing to worry about. What is going to happen to their dollars? I mean, is everything just going to be transferred over to the new system and they're going to get a one for one deal or are they going to lose it or are they going to get pennies on the dollar? What is what is your thoughts on that? Well, for one thing, and I've been thinking about this quite a lot, um, you know, people think that the transition from one monetary system into another monetary system can be the seamless thing and there's no change and nobody knows it. When in reality, all of the laws have been put in place so that during this next crisis, wherever you're holding your wealth, that's where it's going to stay. So if it's in a bank or it's in a brokerage account or it's in an insurance contract or it's in any of those contracts, it's not really yours. Legally, you are not the legal registered owner of any of that wealth. You are the owner of a contract and any contract is only as good as the counterparty to that contract. I mean, JP Morgan was just fined. I think it was 2.8 billion or something like that because they didn't segregate uh, in the brokerage accounts. They did not segregate accounts that should have been segregated separately from their own accounts. And so they, and that's been going on since 2008 through 2016. Low. Okay. Now, those are accounts that were supposed to be segregated. But if you go in and you just open a standard brokerage account, you're agreeing to give them that equity or loan them that equity. You're just the beneficial owner. Actually, it's DTC is the legal registered owner, but you're at the bottom and then everybody between you, all the subsidiaries, et cetera, and DTC, they're all beneficial owners and they're using that money for derivatives to loan out, whatever, to make them money. So, you know, you can feel comfortable. That's the way they want you to feel. But I mean, how, how many scandals Do you have to read or see to say, you know, maybe these guys don't have my best interest at heart. And after all, they keep postponing the fiduciary rule that says that they have to put your interest, the client interest first. No, they don't. They won't make as much money if they do. So, you know, I mean, if you feel safe, then... Then what I would say, honestly, is whatever wealth you choose to keep in the system, whether it's in stocks or bonds or mutual funds or cryptocurrencies or anything, a properly diversified portfolio has some tangible assets in there. All of that stuff is intangible. You can't hold it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. It's not real. It's contracts and it's based purely on trust. When you have gold and physical, physical gold, not ETFs, but physical gold, physical silver in your hands, then you have choices. Then you have real money that truly is outside of the system. So whatever wealth is locked in, you can recoup that. Or you have something to work with. If you're locked out of the system and that's where all your wealth is going to do, good luck taking a statement to the grocery store and say, but look, see, my statement says I have this. You're not going to get that food. You take a piece of silver to the grocery store, you're going to get that food. So how long do you think this transition is going to last? I mean, is it going to be three months, six months? I mean, is this going to be a long drawn out type of thing? Or do they have methods in place where once we make the, you know, once they, you know, the system crashes, do they have everything in place where they can bring it up quickly? Well, I I think it probably depends on the crash. As long as it's not an electrical crash or a grid crash, then, um, you know, that's a really good question. It's going to take a workout. Now I can, As a technician, 
I can tell you that the phase that you're referring to, that whole reset phase, typically lasts on average half as long as the second phase. So if we were just talking about the U.S. dollar, then I would say to you that the um, length of time that's going to take to work all of this out and move us into the new system is probably five years because we know how long the second phase of the dollar's decline was. But this is global, so I'm thinking it's going to take longer than that. So personally, in, in my strategies and when I execute strategies for clients or when we execute strategies for clients, you know, we're more looking at protection um, or, or enabling you to survive until the reset gets to the other side for, you know, you, everybody should do what they're comfortable with. But I like 10 years myself. Um, I think that by the, by the end of 2018, this may come back to haunt me because I hate doing dates. It's beyond my control. But I think that the effects of the um, tax and repatriation is going to be worn off. So unless they can come up with an additional gimmick, I think we'll start to see the breakdown, you know, maybe by the end of this year going into the early part of next year. But there are too many, there are too many pattern shifts that I'm witnessing and even, you know, even Merrill Lynch is witnessing to say this is going to be a long time before it's going to be obvious to everybody. Because that's what you're really asking me. When is it going to be obvious to everybody? You so know, after the so after the transition, let's let's go to the other side now. Uh, um, after the transition is completed or, you know, in effect, you know, going on, maybe it's the seventh year, the sixth year, whatever it is, where people are starting to, you know, you know, work again and people are getting back online and they have the new currency. I mean, are, are we still on the top rung here in the United States or have we moved down a notch? Is the way of life the same, different? What, what happens? Well, uh, number one, like we like you had said a little earlier, the power is shifting from the West to the East. So we are definitely not going to be top dog. And, you know, actually, I do think that we are inside of right now the fourth industrial revolution, which means that for a lot of people, their standard of living is going to drop dramatically as we go through this, we can see that in, in Venezuela, but for, you know, but if you have dry powder, as they are resetting this garbage, there will be the ability and the opportunity to reposition into those income producing undervalued assets, even those that support the new monetary, not just the new money standard, but the new economic model. And so if everything is in the system and everything crashes, you have nothing to work with. But if you have something that's outside, really outside of the system, then when those opportunities present, you start to shift in. So I think that this is when, I mean, this is when we could see, you know, the, the wealthy shift to those that are paying attention and position in at the right time. And now I don't think is the right time to position in cause you, you can't take this garbage that killed the old system into this new system. Supposedly everybody says I'm not an engineer, but they say this system is immutable. You can't change it. Well, if that is indeed true, and I'm going to assume that that's accurate, if you really can't change it, then don't you have to get rid of the crap before you can go into the new system? True. Yes, you do. You I do. mean, that's that's just logical. We can't get out of this. That's why we have to reset. So you can't just move what you have here into there without resetting the bond, resetting the currencies, resetting the stock market, getting rid of all of this extreme overvaluation. And so that's why you always see trends move like this. When we get here and we see that accumulation pattern indicating that the guys that understand what's happening are quietly starting to accumulate 
those income producing assets. Okay. Then you shift, you, you roll into this. That's my feeling on it. You roll into this shift. We can't stop it, but you can take advantage of it. Lynette, are, are you looking at any indicators yourself to see when things are going to really start to fall apart? Yeah, that's what I've been talking about um, really since probably October. But because um, I first noticed that pattern shift starting in September. But as I've been doing this and really looking a little bit differently, I'm finding pattern shifts pretty much weekly. And so and and things are speeding up. So, yes, I am definitely watching this really closely and I'm seeing it and I'm, I'm, you know, maybe in the only time in my life I might actually agree with Merrill Lynch, but I'm in agreement with uh, with their indicators. Lynette, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work and contact you? Ah, well, we have a wonderful YouTube channel, which is uh, YouTube backslash ITM trading. But we're really on all of the social media. So uh, Twitter and Facebook and all of that. And of course, we like in-person, real person stuff. So they can always give us a call at 888-696-4653. And we're really, we work together here as a team and we are always, we love questions. So that's how they can get a hold of us. But check out our YouTube channel. That's where most of, that's where you'll see most of my work. Lynette, once again, thank you very much for being on the spotlight. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Happy New Year and be safe out there. Bye-bye. <laughs>